Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Colleen Berry, chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, talks with Paul Slovic, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, and Scott Slovic, a professor of literature at the University of Idaho. They discuss the psychological obstacles to compassion and how cognitive biases can lead to inaction in the face of the world's largest humanitarian challenges, including genocide, famine, climate change, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. They also discuss what we can do to overcome these obstacles. Let's listen. Paul Slovic and Scott Slovic, thank you both so much for joining me today. You are leading scholars in your respective fields of psychology and literature, and among your many accomplishments, you've published a book together, Numbers and Nerves, and are joining forces on an effort you refer to as the arithmetic of compassion. Paul, let's start with you. Can you first describe what you mean by the the arithmetic of compassion? Uh, Yes. Um, What uh, psychologists have learned over a long period of time is that uh, that uh, we are motivated to uh, to do things by our feelings as well as by our thoughts and reasons for for acting, and so uh, our our feelings are kind of our a compass that gets us through our day when we have to make a lot of different sorts of decisions, and in particular when we're considering uh, a decision about whether or not to help someone uh, in in need. Uh, we uh, we are motivated first, of course, by the fact that this uh, that they need our help, but second, because we feel good about helping them. It's what the economists have called the warm glow of satisfaction that you get when you do something good for someone. And and over time, we we've learned that that our feelings uh, behave in kind of peculiar ways with regard to uh, number or scale. Th- that is. Uh, uh, they don't respond uh, according to the rules of arithmetic, where the rules of arithmetic would be that, okay, you have one person in need, you feel strongly about helping them. Now you've got two people in need, you should feel twice as strong about helping them. Well, it doesn't work that way in ways we can discuss later. You know, the, the, uh, the arithmetic uh, uh, behavior of our feelings is sort of weird. We we say that our feelings are innumerate; they can't count, and so they. Uh, when we rely on our feelings, uh, we we tend to rely. We we uh, we don't uh, take the importance that we give to an individual life and scale it up proportionally as the numbers of lives in, increase. That's just one element of the uh, what we call the deadly arithmetic of compassion. And so uh, we can perhaps dive into that if you'd like. Yeah, so let's let's do that. Um, Paul, how do these psychological factors, how have they been powerful obstacles to effectively managing the COVID-19 pandemic? So exponential spread of the virus is hard for many people to understand, as is its numerical toll in terms of both death and human suffering. In your research, you talk about this concept of psychic numbing and how it challenges people's ability to follow public health guidelines for prolonged periods of time. Can you define for us what psychic numbing is and what it means for combating the COVID-19 transmission, virus transmission? And are there other psychological factors in addition to numbing that may cause us to stop following recommended protective guidelines? What is obvious to us is that we care a lot about individual uh, human lives, and we'll do a lot to protect or rescue an individual in distress. 
but what we what we see around us and what we uh, confirm with uh, with experiments, psychological experiments, is that that concern doesn't scale up. Uh, we feel very strongly about uh, an individual uh, in need. We call that the singularity effect. One person, you know, uh, it's a very valuable life. But then if if you're told, well, there are two people uh, in need, you won't, if you're relying on your feelings, your feelings won't, it won't be twice as strong as they are for one. They're already strong for one. You know, it'd be something less than that. And if I... If I, so the difference between no one at risk and one person is huge. If I told you that there were 20, uh, 27 people in danger, you'd feel badly uh, and concerned. If then I said, oh, wait, I made a mistake, there are 28, you won't feel any different. The feelings, our feelings are not that different. They can't differentiate between 27 and 28. We have to rely on a different way of thinking, which is analytic, which does the math, which does the which simple math, it, say 20, uh, 28 is one more life than 27, and that life is important. Therefore, <laughs> we should work even harder. You have to do that kind of thinking. But uh, the human brain is, is lazy. If we think we can do the job uh, and reacting with our feelings, in, you know, which are easy, we don't bother to do the math. And so then we become insensitive as the numbers of lives increase. So the life that is so important, if it's the very first life at risk, loses its importance via feelings and when, when there are more people at risk and we sort of become uh, insensitive to larger losses. And that's, uh, that's uh, what we call psychic numbing. And we can see that uh, in evidence uh, with regard to the COVID pan pandemic where we're, we are uh, given the statistics every day of, of the uh, case numbers and the death, uh, the death counts and so forth. And they sort of you know, after a while, they just bounce off us. They don't create any feelings in us. We are numb to these statistics. And as, as a result, uh, they don't motivate us uh, as much as, as they should. That's psychic numbing. Now that you ask about other factors, psychic numbing is, is one of the ways that our, that our, our, our feelings deceive us with regard to, to, uh, to COVID. And you mentioned exponential growth. Well, exponential growth uh, of the of the of infection uh, occurs when when an infected person every infected person infects more than one other person, and so it grows. Let's say they infect two people, and and then those two people, each of them infect two others. So you see the growth; it goes from one to two to four to eight to sixteen. That's an exponential uh, growth pattern. And what uh, psychological research, going back to the 1970s, found is that pe uh, people don't grasp exponential uh, growth very readily. They project in a, in a straight line way when it's really steeply rising. And as a result, uh, you know, the, the cases which seem so small uh, right at the beginning but are growing exponentially, uh, we, we sort of, we don't anticipate how quickly they can leap up and overwhelm the system. And that has happened in many parts of the world where uh, even public health officials as well as governments were slow to react because the numbers were still small, but growing exponentially. So that's another way that our, that our perceptions are, are misguided. One other factor, which is really important here, has to do with the ability to maintain uh, uh, adherence to, to the protective guidelines put out by experts. And this is, a, this is a, a problem because we don't feel rewarded for doing the things that we are told to do, like wearing masks, Staying at home, isolating, uh, keeping our distance from people. We, we don't. We don't see the benefits. The, the who who we're uh, uh, being protected from, or who are, who's protected from us. The benefits are invisible uh, because they they wouldn't show up. Uh, they're statistical and invisible. But the costs are immediate and 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 felt directly. So we can feel the cost of having to stay home and and not be able to go to restaurants or bars or to our workplace. We feel the costs and we don't see the benefits. And if we do the wrong things, we don't feel, we don't feel the, the cost of that either. We don't see the harm we're doing, but we see the benefit of not adhering to the guidelines. We get to do what we want to do. So what psychologists call the reinforcement schedule is backwards for what is needed to protect, to maintain behavior over a long period of time. And so that's why we see that even well-meaning people who want to do the right thing, who are listening 
to the experts. They they can't they can't persist in in adhering to this. Uh, you know, over time they start to relax. Uh, so that's those are other uh, psychological factors. The bottom line here is that that um, control over the COVID pandemic is as much a behavioral issue as it is a medical uh, medical and public health issue. That we have to have both the medical side and the behavioral side working in sync to uh, devise uh, ways to keep people doing what the uh, what the experts believe is the right thing to do. So those are incredibly powerful psychological factors that are occurring right now. And I want to get back to, in a moment, what we can do about them. Um, but first, let's bring Scott into the conversation. We've been talking psychology up to this point. But Scott, you're a professor of environmental humanities. You study literature, teach writing, and think about environmental communication. Can you connect the arithmetic of compassion to your own discipline generally and in the context of COVID-19? Yes, thanks, Colleen. Uh, Well, I would first point out that the very phrase arithmetic of compassion comes from literature. Uh, As we explain in the introduction to the book Numbers and Nerves, uh, the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, uh, in a, a poem from the 1970s, titled Mr. Cogito Reads the Newspaper. He actually presents a character in the poem reading the newspaper and reading different kinds of stories, one about uh, a mass casualty event, the other one about a small-scale tragedy. And actually in this poem, Mr. Cogito Reads the the Newspaper, Herbert explores the, the differential ways that his Character, literary character responds to these different kinds of information. And then in the final uh, phrase of the poem is a subject for meditation, the arithmetic of compassion. And so that's where we've stolen this phrase to describe this psychological phenomenon actually emerging from literature. And when when you mentioned that I study literature, you know, of course, I was trained to study poetry and short stories and literary essays and so forth. But what I've come to understand over time is that I'm really interested in and and have certain skills to analyze human cultural expression more broadly, not just um, uh, fine arts, but but varieties of ways in which humans express ourselves and receive information. And in the environmental humanities, um, over time, uh, we've developed a number of uh, significant ways for analyzing our ability, our sensitivity to receive information, and our insensitivity. And what Paul has just been describing in psychological terms are various ways in which we are insensitive to important information. And ironically, the, the more important the information, the larger the scale of a a problem or a challenge, the less sensitive we become. So COVID-19 or genocide. Exactly. Um, or extinction or, um, you know, toxic environments and so forth. The, the, the larger the scale, the less we care, the less sensitive we are. So from an environmental humanities perspective, I'm interested in what some of my colleagues refer to as apprehension. How do we, how do we, find a way to apprehend things that happen on such a vast scale that that psychologically makes us insensitive or happens very slowly. Sometimes these events occur over vast spans of time that exceed human sensory capacity, or they simply take place out of view. We can't see them happening, and thus we uh, um, are insensitive to their significance. And uh, so we refer to this as slow violence in the environmental humanities, things that occur uh, on temporal and spatial scales that challenge our sensory abilities. Uh, Another aspect of the environmental humanities is what uh, people refer to as precarity. And sometimes in my particular field, eco precarity. How do we become sensitive to our vulnerability to certain phenomena? Um, I, I find this particularly relevant to the COVID 19 situation where we see people acting as if life continues as normal. You know, initially there was this 
uh, hypersensitivity to to this new phenomenon that we were unfamiliar with. It was invisible, but we learned that we should be uh, extremely careful about our contacts with other people. And now I see people lapsing into a kind of relaxed condition, finding it very difficult to maintain vigilance. And so understanding various aspects of precarity um, are an ex extremely important on the individual psychological level and also culturally as we try to think about the ways in which certain kinds of people are more precarious or more vulnerable than others. The, this has an ethical component and also a kind of a sensory and a cognitive component. Uh, and then finally, just to boil it all down, I would say that the singularity effect that Paul referred to has a profound relevance to communication that that um, in in literary studies we might refer to at, refer to poignancy something called poignancy what makes a certain way of speaking or a certain way of writing or communicating otherwise poignant more poignant or less poignant and and often we find that when we can reduce the scale of a phenomenon to an individual or some otherwise smaller scale, what some might call human scale, then we can enable our, our audiences to be more sensitive to phenomena that they really should care about. So, so that's great. And I want to sort of go a little more into your discipline here um, and in a personal way, Scott. So during the pandemic, life is, is not normal and people are spending more time at home than usual. And many, um, including, including myself, are looking for interesting books to read, in particular work that can help us understand this experience that we're going through of the pandemic. Um, can you recommend any pandemic literature? And what do you find to be some of the lessons about the about experiencing a pandemic that we can, and you touched on this a little bit a moment ago, but that we can glean from such writings? Yeah. Well, first of all, before the current pandemic occurred and we became aware of it, I, I had never heard the phrase pandemic literature. I know other people were studying this and, you know, some were probably even developing syllabi for courses on pandemic literature. There's a, a vast history of this um, going back centuries, but uh, it, it was not really, you know, on my radar un until I found myself in the midst of a pandemic. And so I, I tend to be a scholar of uh, contemporary literature and culture. And I've realized that many of the, the writers that I'm interested in have been engaged with the subject of disease and large scale disease, epidemics or pandemics. Um, and uh, these include people like the nonfiction writer, David Quammen, who in uh, 2012 published a book called Spillover, which is a sobering and eloquent analysis of zoonotic disease. And I, I was interested in Kwame's work, so I was uh, attentive to the arrival of this book. But I wondered, you know, why was David Kwame writing about zoonosis and, and in addition to um, island biogeography and you know, endangered species and other kinds of things that he writes about in other, in other work? Um, I didn't realize how zoon zoonosis, the, the spillover or leaping of disease from one species to another was so profoundly relevant to our lives every day. It, it took a pandemic to wake me up to the importance of that book from 2012. And then more recently, people have invited me to give talks on pandemic literature. So I've studied up a little bit and been looking at recent examples of this, uh, such as Geraldine Brooks' 2001 novel called Year of Wonders. Um, you know that book, thumbs up to that. Um, and uh, uh, other books um, from an American perspective include Peter Heller's uh, uh, 2012 novel, The Dog Stars. And very recently, uh, obviously written prior to the current pandemic, but published with ideal timing in 2020 is Lawrence Wright's novel uh, called The End of October. And all of these describe different pandemic scenarios, or I don't know whether technically Geraldine Brooks' book, which describes a small village in England, um, 
is a, a pandemic or an epidemic, but there we can take away certain lessons from reading these works in addition to using them as mirrors to our own experience to help us understand things about our own lives, or, you know, recognize aspects of our own lives in this other work that we may not be able to, to see because they're too close to us in our lived experience. Um, I find myself interested in such topics as normalcy and and how it is that characters in I, i'm thinking particularly of the protagonist in the dog stars peter heller's 2012 novel how some sort of influenza epidemic has occurred in north america and perhaps elsewhere in the world it's a little bit hazy the scale of this disease but obviously the casualties have been tremendous and the protagonist has lost uh, even his his wife and all of his community, and he's living a life of isolation, primarily having social contact with his dog. It, it takes place in Colorado, and he, this guy has a small airplane, and he flies around the Rocky Mountains looking down at the landscape, which and everything seems normal below. It looks like it's the world as it's always been, but he's existing in this strange suspended state uh, post epidemic and he's lost the people he cares about. He's isolated from almost all human contact and yet occasionally he lapses into this psychological condition of normalcy. Um, um, feeling comfortable, even appreciating the beauty of what he's looking at. And I find that that lines up very closely to my own experience of the pandemic, where I can sometimes forget that there's a we're in the midst of a very serious public health crisis as I look out my window, as I walk down the street. It's only when I notice my neighbors all wearing masks and when we're walking down the street and we dart to the other side of the street in order to maintain social distance, I realize this isn't normal. Something very strange is going on. And, and I find myself fascinated with this, the, the rising and falling of sensitivity to our, our current public health crisis. I find this explored in the literature too. And by reading the literature, I can be more conscious of what's actually happening in my own lived experience. And that story resonates, I think, for all of us who've lived through the past year. And I'll say that Geraldine Brooks novel definitely brings to mind the point about poignancy that you were talking about before very much comes through in that book. Scott, you and Paul um, seem to share a last name. I'm curious to hear maybe just briefly about how you started collaborating and more generally what it means to bring disciplines together, in, in your case, psychology and literature, to wrestle with humanitarian challenges like COVID and some of the others that we've been speaking about today. Well, uh, Scott and I thought we were working in different fields. Scott, when he decided to be an, you know, to major in English and then uh, environmental literature, uh, you know, it seemed that, uh, that he was on a different path. But as he indicated, uh, people who are studying uh, environment, many of them are, con are concerned about the precarity of, of the environment on which uh, all life uh, depends. And so I was a uh, decision-making and risk scholar also looking at instead of precarity, we call it a risk perception and you know, keeping people safe and healthy. And we realized that uh, we had a similar uh, interest in, in, uh, in protecting uh, life and the environment. And uh, then we started to uh, collaborate and, and uh, particularly we edited this uh, book, Numbers and Nerves. We worked on it for 10 years, you know, just at a slow pace because we so much enjoyed working on it together we didn't we didn't rush and then we realized well it's about time we we, we stopped this and 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 sent this to print which we did so that's kind of how we how we got started on this and scott what's it like working with your dad i would say sometimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and uh, i grew up in, in an environment where we were discussing psychological ideas every day over dinner sports psychology social crises and the need to engage with various situations around the world, humanitarian and environmental crises. So I, I have just uh, woven my upbringing into my profession and 
um, you know, we, we, over the years, I found that I'm particularly interested in psychological dimensions of environmental literature, uh, writing about awareness, sensitivity, poignancy, um, forms of social engagement that might be supported or obstructed by, you know, certain types of cultural expression. And so, uh, over, over time, when we, managed to spend time together, my father and I, um, usually running in the mornings, we would talk about our work and we realized we're actually working on very similar topics. And, um, you know, as, as Paul says, we enjoyed these conversations very much. It was a great pleasure and very exciting to, to actually work actively on a publication project together and observe the way we each work individually on our articles and, and, and collaborate on this larger scale project. We've found, of course, that even though the book was published in 2015, we've been able to continue much of this work by way of uh, creating a website, which we each continue to contribute to. Um, and on the website, we offer many of the basic concepts that are in the book, as well as additional ideas that are not fully expressed in the book. And we've, we've just uh, realized that our collaboration doesn't have to end when the publication occurs, especially with these online formats that enable us to continue developing new ideas and applying them to our current developments in the world. And for our listeners that want to learn more, they can go to arithmeticofcompassion.org, I think. And I want to maybe turn the last question over to you, Paul. Um, and to get back to COVID, what is the most important thing we should be doing right now that we're not doing when you think about the psychological literature that we were discussing earlier? And by we, I mean scientists, journalists, concerned citizens, and government officials. What are the most important lessons from your work? Yes, I'm glad you use lessons in the, in the plural because I think there are multiple uh, multiple uh, lessons and things we, we need to to uh, to focus on. I think the the first is to uh, respect the science, or the science of you know virology and epidemiology, uh, and to to listen to the what the scientists are are telling us about uh, the the disease and how uh, what we should be doing to. Uh, protect ourselves as vaccines now come on the scene and, uh, you know, we tend to relax and yet the problem is still with us. So we pay attention uh, to the uh, uh, to the experts and respect uh, what they're what they're telling us. At the same time, I think, as Scott points out, there's an experiential element here that is the, the disease is difficult to deal with because it's in it's for the most part invisible unless uh, unless we have experienced it personally, uh, clo- you know, uh, up close and personal. Uh, you can look around and everything looks normal, as Scott indicated, when it really uh, isn't normal. And that's, again, where the role of, of uh, experience comes in. So I think that, uh, that journalists uh, uh, in particular could, could uh, play a role in, uh, in you know, showing us the experience uh, of what it's like to, uh, to be ill or to take care of people who are ill. And, and, and they're doing that to a certain extent. You know, in terms of giving us the stories of the uh, the healthcare workers on the front line and how you know uh, how they're uh, struggling to to take care of uh, people, and as well as uh, people who have have been you know and telling us you know how they've experienced it. I think I think we need that kind of personal experience, you know, as much as we do the statistics, maybe more than the statistics, but in addition. So we need that kind of experiential information. Uh, I think. Um, we have to uh, uh, respect the fact that that uh, we have to understand the behavioral principles that make it hard for people to keep following the guidelines, even though it's important. And so, uh, so people need need uh, need assistance there. If, if people are going to relax because they don't see the benefit and they don't see the cost of not doing things, then you need external uh, action. To, to you need some some regulation. You need to say, have consequences for violating the guidelines, uh, and, and also you need to to uh, reward people for following them, and particularly when the, when following them has a has an economic, uh, a social and economic cost to them. You need to try to uh, to uh, to buffer those costs. You know, providing aid, and we see that that's being done to a certain extent. We have to keep doing that. Uh, because people need to, uh, need, need, you know, need to survive uh, economically here, and so you need external factors to come in and and keep people 
uh, towing the line as long as it takes to get this uh, ec- epidemic uh, pandemic under control. Paul Slovic, Scott Slovic, thank you both so much for joining me today on the podcast. Th- thank you, Colleen. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Colleen. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.